are starting. We're live. Hello. Okay, we still don't From have the it. Ground Wait, could you hear yourself 51. a little bit? Fifty-one. What? When he was talking, I could hear you a little bit. Oh, uh, maybe he needs to put some. Oh, let's not complicate things. Yeah, you know? no. it's working right now. Yeah, so. it wasn't. I didn't hear it at the beginning. Classic could... working. Well, first, let's we, we do something. We still have zero so followers, though. I mean, viewers. Followers. It's because you know it always lags. So let's wait to start talking until they come on, right? Yeah, but oh, I gotta. Ian's, okay. Ian's gonna start yelling at me if I don't mention Southeast Carpet Fest. Okay, go for you it. You know that. Was it February tenth? You gotta fact check me. February tenth in yes. Cape Coral, Florida. If you are going, mark going. Um, a lot of people said like maybe or something like that. So Ian's trying to get a good head count of how many people will be at Southeast Carpet Carpet Fest. So if you are over there in Florida. And if you are going, please mark the invitation. And then also, um, also there is a auction for okay, Southeast yeah. Carpet Fest. <laughs> we picked you up a little bit there, but there's an auction for Southeast Carpet Fest. If you go to their Facebook page and um, they're auctioning stuff for us arc, there's a whole bunch of cool stuff. I mean, $500 vouchers for snake for, Phoenix Reptiles, Rage Beer Reptiles, all the people that you've heard on the podcast. I mean, so many people donate things. Um, we donated a one-of-a-kind t-shirt that's only going to be printed once. Woo-hoo. And um, just check everything out and check out Ian's page. And if you're going to sell the Carpet Fest, or even if you're not, get the auction items. And then secondly, real quick, if you want to support the podcast, support the YouTube videos, support us. You can click the Amazon affiliate link. I don't know why I'm looking at you so hardcore right now, but you can click the Amazon affiliate link <laughs> and buy anything like you normally would. And a little bit of change goes to us, even though you're not paying, spending any more money. Stop looking at you now. You're going weird. <laughs> and then um, there's also t-shirts available on portcitypythons.com. And that is really it. Today we are going to be talking with Stu Tennyson from Stu's Herp on Gray Band King Snakes, also known as Alterna. And um, just a whole lot to talk about. Stu has spent probably most of his life um, studying Alterna, whether it be in the wild or in Casper. So, Stu, how did you first get into King Snakes? Well, um, I guess, well, the first time I saw a, a Gray Banded King Snake was in 1966. Uh, a friend of mine uh, had collected some, and back then, you know, nobody even knew what they were. But I saw them, and I just I knew that those were like no more about. I think I was twelve years old then. Uh, so where did you grow up? Did you grow up here in Texas? No, California. Oh okay. wow! So when was the first time that you went out to West Texas to actually see them in the wild? Um, well, back, of course, then there wasn't a whole lot of information about where they were from or much of anything, but, um, just because of what my friend had told me, he was a little bit older than me and he'd gone collecting out there and found some. So when uh, I had an opportunity in, uh, 1977, I was being transferred from, uh, Washington DC to, to, um, beach, California. And on my way uh, through Texas, I went out there and stopped. And um, time to hunt for him in 77. And I didn't awesome. know where I was going. I didn't know where to look. I, you know, I mean, there was just no information. I mean, I knew nothing. You know, I didn't know what, you know, what kind of temperatures they liked. I mean, I knew I'd, I'd done night hunting before in California for snakes. I knew that, you know, nighttime was the right time. But uh, I didn't know or much of anything. So it was pretty interesting. Were you successful that first time out? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I was only successful in burning up a whole lot of gasoline and looking <laughs> around. And uh, I don't even think I saw hardly any snakes. I'm trying to think. I think it was in August I went. Um, and I didn't see much of anything. But I did get an idea of the lay of the land. So, I mean, you know, I, I, you know my, my knowledge base was beginning Okay, so if you could explain to people, like, where do uh, gray band king snakes inhabit? And exactly, I mean, people may know they're in West Texas, but where exactly and how could you go find them? 
Well, they have a pretty wide range of habitat um, in as, as far as um, elevation uh, and, you know, geography of, you know, where they're from as far as, uh, you know, rocks and flats and all kinds of different areas. They predominantly seem to be found uh, where there's like rocky hillsides. Um, and of course, in Texas, a lot of the land is privately owned. So it's hard to even get access to most of their habitat. So the only real places you can hunt, unless you know somebody that has private land or something, is along the, uh, the roads where there's rock cuts and where there's hills that come down to the edges of the roads. Um, arroyos are, are pretty, uh, pretty good. Um, but as far as finding them, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's not like you're going to go out there and fill up gunny sacks full. <laughs> yeah. You know, even if you know where to find them and when to go, they're still pretty scarce. So you go out there with low expectations. <laughs> that's a good way to put it yeah low <laughs> expectations that's i kind of look at it like this over the years i mean I, i've i've gathered a lot of uh information about when and where to find them i kept a log of every time i found one temperatures and humidities and all that kind of stuff so i pretty much narrowed down the optimum time and places to find them but then um th that's only you know so much and then at that point it's just luck to find to, to be at the right spot where one happens to be crawling out of a uh, a crack in the rock somewhere, you know, now, the time that you happen to be. For someone listening or watching and wants to save a lot of time, what may be the optimal time <laughs> and temperature? <laughs> well, um, really, from about let's see, I found them from May to October. And it really is very dependent on the weather patterns that West Texas is having. Um, the, you know, they prefer temperatures like in anywhere from the low 70s to the low 90s. Optimum seems to be right around the upper 70s seems to be most productive for me. <clears throat> and of course, everything that I'm saying here tonight is only from my own experience and not necessarily carved in stone. You know, I'm not trying to say that if, you know, that that's the only time you'll ever find them because, um, you know, snakes or any animals are kind of odd sometimes. I mean, you'll always find that odd one out in a, in a, in a, a time when it's not optimum. But, um, but that seems to be about the best time. Upper 70s seems to be about the best. Um, usually uh, either right before a thunderstorm is good, but, you know, a lot of these things you can't really plan for when, you know, if you've got to drive. 500 miles to get there you don't know if there's going to be a thunderstorm when you get there or not uh but that's always nice if there's a thunderstorm uh somewhere in the distance um and then um you know the time of year is important because uh early in the season you know snakes are, are breeding and usually um the there's kind of a collecting bias you're going to find mostly males female to breed to earlier in the season and then usually like around June or so when the snakes are laying eggs, then you're not going to, you know, they can be kind of scarce other than, again, the males. Or once the females lay eggs, then they're, they're hungry and they're going to be out crawling around again. Uh, but again, it, it's, it's, it's so dependent on the weather. And it's, it, you can't say, for instance, um, June is always the best month. Because for me, it hasn't always been the best month. Um, you know, I've had other months that the weather conditions and the weather patterns, you know, they change quite a bit because it kind of depends on the weather comes up from Mexico into the Chihuahua desert. So, and I mean, you're at a higher elevation. So are there like big temperature and weather swings? Well, yeah, the range is, you know, from about Del Rio up to El Paso and all those counties along the way. And so there's a lot of different types of habitat and different elevations. And sometimes, um, uh, you know, a thousand feet and the temperature is much cooler. So a lot of times when I'd go out hunting, I would start out early in the evening in the higher elevations and then work my way down um, to where the temperature is, you know, is still going to be conducive.
But just to kind of put it into perspective, I, I uh, several years ago, I went through my notes and I um, uh, added up all the hours of hunting for all the number of Alterna that I've found in my lifetime. And it's 55 hours. Whoa. <laughs> per snake of hunting. Now that's not, oh, man. you know, stopping and getting a hamburger. That's not, you know, getting, <laughs> you know stopping and getting a, you know, gas up or driving. Driving eight I'm hours out nearly, there. I'm talking just hunting time, just hunting time, 55 hours per snake. Wow. Mm, that's not hunting. worth it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why I, you know, I want to make that point because I don't want people to think they can just grab a couple of gunny sacks and drive out there and oh it's 78 degrees let's fill up the gunny sacks with gray bands uh that's not going to happen it's it really takes a lot of hard work but um what helps is knowing some of those conditions and locations and things like that that kind of narrows it down a little bit i'm gonna go um um you know i don't know fishing for bass or something you're not going to go out in a big sand pile you know, fishing for bass, you're going to go where there's some water, <laughs> you know, right. that kind of thing. So, you know, if you have a basic idea of what the habitat for the gray bands is like, you have a basic idea of the temperature and the time of year and what their behavior is like, then that helps um, probably improve the odds of finding something. Now, the herpeticulture has changed a lot since, I mean, I had heard that in the 70s and so it was like, Alterna were kind of a holy grail for keepers in North America. So um, from when you started to now, how has it changed as far as people's interest in gray banded king snakes? Well, the, the whole, I think the whole reptile industry has changed a lot. And that has, of course, caused, I think, a ripple effect in all the different species and things like that. But like you're saying, it's right. It is back in the, the 70s and the 80s, the gray banded king snake was the holy grail of colubrid snakes in North America. And um, people came from all over. I've, I've run into people from Europe and um, all kinds of far off places out there hunting for them. Um, but then as people started breeding them and producing more of them in captivity, uh, it kind of popularized them a lot more. And then the industry itself changed. Um, uh, from starting about, I guess, the 90s until now, um, you know, there's so many more people breeding snakes of all species that uh, it's it's a lot more common to see them, you know, like gray bands at a snake show or, or to, you know, have people all over the country that are producing them that, you know, can sell them. And um, so they're a little bit more uh, available. Right. Yeah, I would think you'd be hard pressed to find someone who would invest fifty five hours in going to find one these days instead of buying one for seventy five dollars <laughs> at a at a reptile show. But, you know, there's there's ups and downs to that though, because like if somebody just goes to a reptile show and buys a snake for one hundred fifty bucks in a deli cup, that they don't have a clue as to how difficult you know it was to maybe produce it or to get it or find it or whatever. It kind of, it kind of, um, I don't know, undervalues the animal a little bit, you know. Yeah, I think um, there's definitely less appreciation if you don't put in that hard work. Yeah, it's like when I, you know, the ones that I produce. I mean, I really kind of have a, a personal interest in this because this is my hobby. It's not a, a commercial business of mine. It's just something I've liked doing for a long time. Um. And, and it's, it's not just finding the animals that takes a long time that's difficult, but it's also breeding them, hatching babies started. You know, they all want to eat lizards out of the egg. Uh, so, um, you know, there's a lot more to it than, than that. So when, you know, somebody buys one for 100 or 150 bucks, I, I don't think they have a clue unless they've gone through any of that to know uh, what's all involved in you know, finding them, raising them, getting them feeding. You know, it's uh, they don't all want to eat pinkies out of the egg, that's for sure. Right. And I mean, <laughs> they're not, they're definitely not all created equal as far as, can you explain a little bit of, um, you know, you see some that are labeled gray banded king snake at a reptile show 
or you go to like one of your tables and you could get down to the exact town it's from, or even some people have GPS coordinate coordinates and stuff. So can you explain a little bit of how the localities work and what differentiates some of the localities? Well, sure. Um, like I, I said earlier, you know, they're found from about Del Rio up to El Paso. And um, in between, there's a lot of different habitats. And it's kind of like um, probably the, the majority of the habitat that they're from is, is Rocky Hills. Although they have been found in flats and a few other uncommon areas, but the predominant area seems to be these hills. So um, the snakes that are found from certain hills or mountains you know, are, are what they call different localities. Like, for instance, the Davis Mountains. You, know, you have Davis <laughs> Mountain localities. That's my name. <laughs> Lame. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and then within the Davis Mountains, there's a couple of different canyons that have, you know, uh, gray bands have been found. Um, then you get up, you know, a little further north, you got the Waco Mountains and the Guadalupe Mountains, and you got the River Road. Uh, and uh, places down in Brewster County, Christmas Mountains, and stuff like that. Um, because the the, the 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 population of gray bands is spotty, it's easy to pinpoint different localities where they're from. Unlike, say, the Texas rat snake, you know, you you can't hardly have a locality Texas rat snake other than I mean, they're found all over. I mean, you right. can say that yeah, this is from you know. Uh, the field over here and the southern ones from the field over there, but they're found throughout like North Texas, Dallas, Fort Worth area. You find Texas rat snakes everywhere. Right. Um, but gray band and king snakes are, are kind of localized right. in certain spots. So the ones that are found in certain of the certain areas um, are named for their locality. Now, what makes one locality? better than like the ones in the Davis mountains versus you said the Christmas one, what makes one better than the other? Well, all the localities that I have are the best. The <laughs> <good>. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, some of the different localities are harder to find than other localities. That's one thing that kind of makes them more valuable. Um, some of the localities have prettier specimens. And that makes them, special uh, and that's probably the you know the main things that makes the different localities one better than another but there's not really you know to say one's better than another um uh i i think that some of the areas are maybe they're more rare in one spot than another and that might make them a bit more desirable but there's kind of like different people that are involved in this gray banded uh stuff that uh, like some people don't care about localities. They just want pretty ones, you know, so right. you can find pretty ones just about anywhere, you know, they can turn up anywhere or you can breed them and produce them. And, uh, cause I talked to lots of people all year long that are, um, you know, just getting into gray bands and they want one that looks like, well, you know how it is. Like when you first were uh, starting out in, in herpetology, you know, you, you look at books and you see pictures plates color plates of different animals and, and so that's the images that you imprint on so you know then you want one that looks just like that i get people all the time saying oh i want them one that looks like you know one in this book or that book or whatever um but then the, there's some that are like the real picky aficionados that want them from particular localities they don't really care what they look like they're more interested in the rare locality you know um, so it's kind of, it's, it's kind of like can go either way. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely the quintessential gray banded King that you think about whenever someone says it, like there is a quintessential <laughs> for you, I think, yeah, orange gray, and black, black. Orange, like... gray, black, orange. <laughs> but I mean, you're talking about, you have some locality animals that are just gray and black that have no orange at all. And there's some with lightning bolt like patterns and, oh, okay. I haven't seen those. I mean, they're very distinct. Now, as far as mutations go, like when did mutations ever come into it? And they're all specific locality, correct, at this point? Um, no, you mean as far as mutations like the leucistics and the hypos and the an 
Azanthics right. and stuff like that. Some of them are um, locality specific and some of them are not. The leucistics um, were produced by through chance breedings with just some generic gray bands. They just popped out. So the leucistic line uh, is not locality specific. I was saying that. But then um, the uh, anatheristic and the hypos, uh, from what I understand anyway, is they came out of some um, black gap gray bands that were collected a while back. And that's kind of where they started from. But I know that uh, a couple of um, other mutant morphs have popped out of some breedings from some other localities. Yeah, I have. And so I, I don't really know all the people that have bred those, you know, because they've kind of gotten mixed up. So some of them could be generic and some could be locality now. Okay. Yeah, I had seen a few that were labeled like granite. I had a few that were labeled like gray sided or something that only had black speckles down the top of it. And um, I mean, they just seem so polymorphic. Are there size differences or anything by locality? Well, um, from what I've seen, and I've seen a lot of specimens, it seems like the further east you go, they tend to be a little bit larger. And the further west you go, they tend to be a little bit smaller. That seems to be the general rule. And likewise, the further east you go, the more blair eye morphs you get, you know, the ones that have the wide orange saddles okay, and the gray background ones like that tend to be more to the east. And then to the west, you tend to get more of them that just have the, the light gray and the narrow black bands and very little orange and sometimes no orange at all. So I've um, seen likewise. Then the I've seen ahead. people um, label things as alterna, alterna and alterna, um blair dye or blair eye or something like that is there any yeah. so are they subspecies and what's the deal with that well i think originally um when they were first described they were described as two separate species you had lampropeltus blair eye uh which was the ones that have the big orange saddles and the gray backgrounds sometimes dark and then you had the lampropeltus alterna which was the uh gray with the skinny black bands but that was based on just a couple of specimens back then i think i don't know back in the 50s that were found um and you know through further investigating and collecting and um studying you know it was found that you find those different types of morphs all over the place and that that led to some people you know redescribing the species and eventually coming up with the fact that it's one species um you know, Lampropeltus alterna. Uh, okay, so... Um, yeah, no, no, it, no does, it does. It does make total sense. <laughs> um, as far as collecting these days, um, you obviously have a large collection. Are you still collecting out of the wild, or what is the balance there between animals that you wild catch for, like, new genetics or something like that and animals that you breed yourself? Well, I don't, um, I still go out there just cause I like being out there and, um, I, I don't really look to really find that. I, I don't really want to find that many more Alterna to tell you the truth. I just go out there to just to look for them and just to be out there and enjoy being there. I, um, I occasionally, you know, if, if I'm going to want to find one, I want to find one that's going to augment one of my locality breeding groups that I already have started. You know, so, so are you going to very specific localities every time to check for your yeah. specific projects or are you still going all over? Exactly. No, 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 exactly. That for the last probably probably about the last 10 years, all I've done is gone to specific rock cuts looking for specimens from just one one little area to add to my breeding groups. But I'm not I, I'm, I'm pretty well rounded out in all of my localities that I'm working with. So I, I kind of just go out there to have fun now. <laughs> yeah. So as far as the babies go, you said that the babies are hard to get started. Are those wild caught animals hard to get started? Um, no, actually. I mean, I've always had pretty good luck with the wild caughts. Um, I've heard some people say they've had some trouble with some, but I've never had any problem getting them eating. 
Um, and I, I've got a theory behind that too, is that because I've bred so many alterna over the years that I've, I've seen some hatch out that don't have a real strong desire to thrive. And then I've had some that come out of the egg that are just, you know, gangbusters. Right. So I think in the wild, what happens is that, that that happens in the wild. These eggs hatch out and the babies are born. And some um, are just uh, real aggressive and they're going to go after food and they're going to grow and they're going to, um, you know, uh, take care of themselves and, and they're going to be hardy and, and mature and become breeders. And that's the, you know, that's the natural selection of, of animals in the wild. And the weaker ones are going to get uh, eaten or preyed on or die. Mm -hmm. Now, do you so, see any um, difference in that behavior as you go up as far as generations out of the wild call your F twos and threes? Um, no, not really. I mean, it's it's kind of you you know I, you would think that you'd see them eating better after uh, you know several generations, but I mean, I'll get some some years I'll get everything started real easily, and other years it's like you know. Um, but I wanted to go back to what one thing I wanted to uh, point out about those um, uh, the wild cots. See, I think my theory is that you know all the weak ones that don't eat well die off, and so when you do find them in the wild, those are the hardy ones, and that's why they eat well. I don't, I don't that know, makes I, sense. I, I don't. Yeah. Yeah, but and I also wanted to kind of digress back a minute to when we were talking about the two different species. I, I think it's kind of. Um, I don't know. I think it's important to point out that uh, just my own theory, you know, it's just like I said, this isn't anything that, you know, I don't even, you know, it's not really uh, anything I've, I've researched significantly, but it's just my observations over the years is that, you know, um, science always likes to be real precise about stuff. You know, people want to study something and say, well, this is absolutely the way it is. But um, I kind of look more at the broader big picture of you know that you know we're just humans in a short little snapshot in time. And what I think with these alternas, one of two things, they're either beginning to separate and become two separate species, or they're two separate species that over time are growing. And that's why you have so much variation. You have some that are larger, some that are smaller, some that have a lot of orange, some that don't, and a, a lot of variation in them. You know, if we could stick around for 10,000 years, we'd probably be able to solve the issue and see what they actually turn out to be. <laughs> right, or create a whole nother issue. But are, yeah. they, are they totally isolated? Just are there parts of the rock cuts and stuff that are completely isolated from the other um populations and stuff of these guys well i i think to, to a certain extent they are um it's kind of like um you know what they call the sky islands out in the sonora desert you know um you got the mountain ranges out there that over time have become separated from each other uh with the expanse of the sonora <laughs> desert in between so the animals that are differently and become more. I think there's a oh, no, you're skipping real bad uh -oh. I, I think there's a certain amount of uh oh did he drop off for everyone oh. else oh he's coming back it keeps going in and out <laughs> hello can you hear us? Hello? Yes. Yep, we're back. All right, so the last thing we got was about the Sonoran Desert. Yes. Uh-oh. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> oh, not back yet. Um, well, while he's having technical difficulties... Um, so people ask for shout outs and I have no problem <laughs> doing that. Um, Aaron Wagner, he's only 10 years old, but he's watching us. And I think that's awesome. Thanks for watching. And oh, no. someone... Are you there? yes, yes. Yep, Can you yep. hear us? 
Oh. Someone else who asked for Junior a shout out was Junior Gems, Reptiles, and Life. We appreciate anyone who watches us and just we're always very thankful. So. And apparently the shout outs is a good way to kill time while our technology doesn't <laughs> work. Here. All right. I got you that time. Hey, I don't know hey, why. There we go. Oh, there you oh. go. I can hear you. Oh, don't move. Wait. We can't talk. Don't move. Uh oh. Oh no! How how was it going so good, and then it just totally know, screws up like that? I don't can... get it. All right, you're going in and out. <laughs> we can hear some noises. Something's yeah. going on. Oh, you're just in for a second. Kind of coming in and out, breaking up a little bit, but uh, it's, it still shows. You hang up to video call. Let's see if I can join the call. All right, now you're coming in great. Well, clear the video's not there, but your sound yeah. was very clear. Can uh, let's see what's I going on. While it's still messing up, someone asked what beer we're drinking. It's probably my third or fourth week in a row drinking this beer because I'm kind of obsessed with it. It is Four Corners oh. Brewing Company, Notorious Oak. Oh, he's back, though. Oh, we're back. <laughs> All right, so the last thing we got was the expanding Sonora Desert. Yeah, yeah. Well, kind of looking at that and comparing it to West Tech Guts, that. Um, but then you've got a lot of other areas – where um it's not like that <laughs> uh the the range of these the snakes is still really not well known because um you know it's kind of like i was saying in science you know everybody wants to be real specific and as soon as they discover something they want to say well that's, that's the way it is i'm an expert i know what i'm talking about it's one area type of habitat um and then later they find them somewhere else. Then they have to change, you know. And I, so for years, um, you know, they, they have quite a range and they're found in some unusual places. But I think the population concentrations are higher in the rocky hillside type areas. You know, that's the habitat that's more desired where they can do better. There's more food source, things like that. Have they ever been found in Mexico or outside of Texas at all? Oh, yeah, yeah. They range way uh, south. In fact, the range uh -huh. in Mexico is much greater than here in the, the U.S. Um, uh, they range, uh, I know, as far down as, um, I want to say Saltillo, Mexico, uh, probably a few hundred miles south of the border uh, with a really broad area Um that they that you know that the range covers uh the you know about a dozen counties in west texas that they range up into and is there a, a different look in those mexican animals and also are they available in the hobby um there's some people that are breeding some of the mexican uh alterna and they do look a little bit different i think um I haven't seen a lot from Mexico. I don't know, probably, I don't know, a couple of dozen or so. Um, and they, just like up here, they look a little different from different areas. <clears throat> and, and I, I guess think, I should, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, I, I think there's a certain point uh, in the southern part of the range where they integrate with what they call the variable king snake, Lampropeltus theri which is um, another one of them that's in the Mexicana group. Okay, yeah, I've kind of thought Never that. Heard of that. I thought that maybe they would integrate with Mex Mex, but then again, I'm not great at knowing where the range of some of the North American colubrids are. Well, and and I'm not either. I don't know that. I mean, I've I've had all of those snakes at one time or another and I've um, you know, I've seen all the publications on all of them and I just don't recall at the moment um if uh, there's an integration zone for Mex Mex and Alterna, 
I'm pretty sure there is for Therai, but I don't think there is for Greerai. Mm -hmm. um, but there might be for the Mexicana Mexicana. That's interesting. But it's like, um, what was I going to ask? As far as I don't, not 100% on the Texas hunting laws and stuff, but I think you can't get animals off the road. And what is it like you're driving streets that are kind of through these rock canyons or something like that? And then there's rocks on both sides and you spotlight in the rocks. How does hunting work exactly? Well, yeah, the laws have changed over the years. They kind of go back and forth uh, different ways. But the way it is now, you can't spotlight from a vehicle. Um, you have Why? to get out and walk the cuts with too flashlights. Easy, what? What's that? I guess it's too easy, then, right? That would be why they changed it? Well, no, I think, like I think there's a little bit of politics involved um, within the state. I think there's some... Uh, some folks that um, you know just don't think that kindly to reptile hunters, um, and then there's some that don't, you know, just don't want people collecting wildlife, non-game animals at all. Um, and then you got some that are on the safety side of the house say that well, it's it's unsafe to be you know cruising at 20 miles an hour along a, a highway that's uh, posted speed limit of 70, and you know all these different involved in determining these laws um but now the way it is is you have to get out and walk you know the roadways along the rock cuts interesting so it's safer in your car than walking along the, sh the road well i think it is and 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 the, the other thing too is i mean it, it's kind of a collecting uh bias um if you have to get out and walk you can't cover as much area as you can from a car but then again you see more when you walk than you do when you spotlight but then also there's um i i think it kind of is unfair for uh, children and older people and handicapped people uh, because they can't get out and walk these cuts you know these are rocky you know difficult uh areas to to, to walk along you got big rocks and cactus and all kinds of stuff and um you know, unless you're in really good shape and, you know, can handle walking in, in that kind of area, it's, it's, it's not fair to those that can't. Right. And now I'm not that familiar of snake days and stuff like that. Can you explain a little of that? And do you go to snake days? I've gone to some of the snake days and just due to my schedule, I've, I've missed a few. Um, but that's an event that was started up in Sanderson to kind of promote the hobby a little bit and to make people aware, especially out in that community in the, in the West Texas area, make people aware of uh, the, the snake hunters that were going out there and doing this. Cause there's so many snake hunters that go out there every year, not just snake hunters, but just, you know, nature hunters and people looking for stuff and lizards and everything else. And not all people go out there looking to catch and keep stuff. They just want to see stuff. Um, and there was so much, um, I don't know, like uh, animosity between like law enforcement, uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife and snake hunters. And everybody had different opinions of, you know, how these people were and everybody, you know, how judgmental people can be. So uh, that was the, an event that was created to help, you know, kind of balance things out and educate everybody uh, as to what uh, snake hunters were really all about. Because I think it's, it's pretty cool. Are snake days everywhere in the country? No, uh, uh, no, just the snake days that just started up in Sanderson, Texas. Um, mainly, you know, the the people that that hunt reptiles out there, and and the um, you know, the mainly the alternative people that yeah. kind of created it. But I, I'm sure that there's there's uh, I know that there's other things that have started up since then, um, because I know there's like a, a movement to. Um, uh, kind of stop some of these rattlesnake roundups yeah um, so there's, you know there's some people that are you know actively involved in that and i know that there's i forget what they're called uh, uh rar is it that well it? there's um they're having like the rattlesnake festival and stuff in austin and yeah yeah that's it where they're trying to just really educate the public on what it's all about yeah so i'm sure there's yeah. probably stuff maybe starting up in other places too. But um, 
there's so much controversy about West Texas because, uh, you know, it was kind of like the Mecca of, for snake hunters to everybody converged in that area. Right. So, I mean, are people really worried about over collecting? Well, some people are worried about it, but I personally, I think that that's uh, nothing to worry about because there's probably less than 1% of the um, uh, potential habitat that's even accessible by the general public. It took so, him 55 so I, hours for one. I don't well, think we're really <laughs> over oh, There's not enough of them, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you're finding it. <laughs> well, really... And, and, you know, that's really important to put that out because a lot of people, you know, they, they hear about it, they read and, they, you know, they, oh, yeah, I want to go out there. I want to catch all these snakes. And it's tough. I mean, you know, you're talking like I used to come out there from uh, California back in the 70s. And then when I was living in Oklahoma, I used to come down from Tulsa. And uh, sometimes, you know, you from California, it was like 1,200 miles to drive one way, you know, several tanks of gas and a couple of nights in a hotel. And, I mean, the price tag... You might, if you're lucky, after two weeks, you might find one snake or two snakes. You know, after spending a couple of thousand dollars in expenses, <laughs> you know, yeah, you it's not exactly. A, it's not a return on that'll your investment. weed a lot of people out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's yeah, it's 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 it can be pretty uh, it's it can be pretty interesting. Now, when you're out there, do you see all types of colubrids and different kinds of snakes? But some of the areas are more productive than others for seeing, you know, large amounts of stuff. Um, but yeah, yeah, you, you usually, you know, like I've seen just about everything out there one time or another. So that's always kind of fun because I don't, I don't keep everything I see. So I get to see a lot of stuff. Uh, but then there's some people that go out there and hunt and they, collect everything that they can find and, you know, and take them back, take everything they can. So I, I know that there's like little pockets of areas that probably get over collected. Um, but I think because of the wide expanse of the range of most of those animals long to repopulate uh, areas. Really. Yeah, it really opened my eyes when I read Bill Love's book and he was talking about West Texas and Arizona and how people are really going against people hunting around there, but just how expansive the land is and how unhabitable it is for human beings and how it's so hard to even find snakes there because it's so expansive and so harsh of a climate. But like for something like, like I really like bear rat snakes, but I don't see many people breeding them out there. So, I mean, that's an animal that I uh, is out there in West Texas, but I don't see a lot. I've found several Baird's rat snakes over the years um, from Valverde County, Del Rio area, uh, all the way to the Davis Mountains. Mm -hmm. They're not real um, uncommon if you go to the right places at the right times. There was a study that I read years ago, a long time ago. Um, I, I don't remember who did it or what, of, but a guy was studying the uh, Western banded geckos out in the Mojave Desert of California. I, I think what generated the study was they were talking about putting in a road somewhere, a new road or something. And then um, some environmentalists were saying, well, no, it's going to cause all these animals to get run over and killed on the roads and it was going to decimate the populations and all this stuff. So this guy did the study. If you've ever, if you ever get a chance or if you've ever been to the Mojave desert, um, there's areas you can walk around out there at night and, um, you know, what a, like a, um, what do they call it? A, uh, like a, a sand hummock. It's like a mound where a, a creosote bush grows out of, and because of the root structure, it kind of holds some of the sand in place and makes like a little mound. And then mm. the sand is a little bit lower around it. So you have this little mounds all over the place. And in these mounds, you've got uh, rats, kangaroo rats that burrow into these root structures and make little burrows. And you can go out there at night sometimes with a flashlight and look in these burrows, and every single burrow that you look in will have one gecko in it. Hmm. Right there at the entrance, you know, waiting for a bug to walk by to eat. Mm -hmm. So you walk out there. I mean, there's literally hundreds of these geckos everywhere. Um, 
so this guy did the study and it was really interesting. I thought the, the, the way he contrived it and figured it out, he went out and uh, of course, you know, cordoned off a certain specific area, you know, um, to work in and then um, took a population count of all the little holes, marked all the little holes where all the geckos were. And then he went around and collected all the geckos and then went back, you know, over periodic time and noticed that all the holes had more geckos in them <laughs> <laughs> over just time. Kept coming, um, and they, coming. Yeah, yeah. And what he determined over after a while was that um, those holes were prime uh, um, ambush points for the geckos to sit and wait for a bug to walk by at night. But the dominant gecko in the area took control of the spot. So as soon as you remove that one dominant gecko, the next one in line, whoever that was <laughs> in that area, took over. And be, uh, that there was just, uh, you know, an endless amount of these geckos that would, you know, they're just waiting for the, you know, the old guy to die off or get eaten or whatever <laughs> so they could take over the prime <laughs> spot. So anyways, the, the, ulti the, the you know, the um, conclusion of the study was that and and, you know, running over a bazillion geckos is not going to make any difference in their population because, again, getting back to the expanse of the desert is so great, you know, that you're just, you're just never going to. Um, There's always going to be another one. Yeah, yeah. And, and I really think that's the way it is in West Texas, even more so because out there it's almost all private land you can't get to anyway. So you mm -hmm. never from those areas you just collect where you can which is it's just minuscule little rock cuts here and there along the highways and that's about it right so let's shift to captive care and keeping them in captivity well kind of beginning to that i wanted to ask we talked about earlier getting the wild caught feeding and i wanted to ask what uh do you start those wild caught uh what do you start feeding them well, the wild caught snakes, like I say, are, I've always been pretty lucky with all of them that I've had. They immediately go to um, mice, you know, frozen thawed mice. Usually they take them readily. Or if I have to, I might have to jump start them a little bit by maybe scenting the mouse with a little piece of lizard skin or something. But once they start eating, it's like not a problem. Okay. Is it? Boy, is it easy to say that they, as babies, start off on lizards and small geckos and then graduate to mammals? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And, um, uh, well, it's, I mean, there's, there's a multitude of situations. Uh, you know, like, you know, if you hatch out a lot of them, like, like I have in the past, um, you have some that won't eat anything, <laughs> you know, no matter what yeah. you try. And uh, then you have some that, you know, they'll take a lizard and you have some that will only take a live lizard or some that will only, you know, take certain species of lizards. So it can get really tricky. Um, and so you have to, you know, play around with them and, you know, try different things uh, to get them to eat. And, of course, you know, it's, it's hard to uh, uh, come by uh, large quantities of small lizards. So, you know, the, the best thing is to try to get them switched over to pinkies as soon as possible. If you have tons and tons of money <laughs> to go to PetSmart. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah to buy tons of pinkies. Mm -hmm. But uh, um, no, the lizards, uh, you know, that, that's the key because the, um, in their habitat, again, having spent a lot of time in the field, uh, the, the lizards are hatching the same time the gray bands are hatching. Oh, okay. You know, that's, you know, how nature, yeah, nature's, you know, it's nature's design, you know, to provide food sources for everything. Right. And, so you got tons, tons of baby lizards hatching out, same time the gray bands are hatching out, and that's what they want to eat. Now, I mean, their lamper pelvis, their king snakes, are they eating other snakes? Um, I've seen a few accounts of them eating other snakes before, and I've actually had some cannibalize uh, each other in captivity. Um, so, yeah, you know, they're, they're a king snake. They're an opportunistic feeder. They're going to eat whatever they can probably get a hold of. And especially once they get a little bit bigger and, you know, get uh, a little bit more aggressive and get some size on them. And, um, you know, they're going to eat just about anything they can find. Have you had breeders go at each other? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's what I've had uh, eat each other before. Like, um, I keep all my snakes separate. But I have occasionally, um, twice it's happened, 
where I, I've introduced a male into a female's cage and then I leave them for a little while to breed. You know, I don't sit there and, and watch them. Um, and uh, I can, males have been devoured or at least attempted to be devoured, but were too big. So the females, after they killed them, tried to eat them and then spit them out. <laughs> That's a waste. You're like, I hope they at least get a meal out of it. <laughs> so uh yeah so i know they do it so i'm sure that they and uh, you know they'll eat other um species of snakes too i'm sure they'll eat just about any kind of reptile or you know whatever they can find right now what are some of your tricks to get the babies going oh that we can talk about that forever um <laughs> well that's what people want to know because you know well, if you have a um, usually when i get a batch of hatchlings you know, I try them all first on just a frozen thawed pinky and see if any of them will take that. And then occasionally, you know, like maybe one out of 20 or 30 might take one. So then that one's going to be okay, you know. And then I go to the next round and then and, and I might do something like um, try scenting the pinkies with a little piece of lizard skin on the nose of the of the frozen thawed pinky and try to get them to take. Um, sometimes you can... Uh, um, do what they call split braining uh, pinkies mm -hmm. and there's a lot of different techniques to do this my technique is I take an exacto knife with the real small skinny blade and I take the pinky and just you know the frozen thawed thawed out pinky and just stick the blade kind of into the nose into the brain just barely just enough to make a small incision and then squeeze out some of the brain juice <laughs> on the tip of the pinky nose, not, not enough to make a big mess. <laughs> and then. <laughs> well, if I was hungry, then... I definitely wouldn't be hungry anymore after that. <laughs> oh, the pinkies are great, especially with like, you know, a little bit of like cocktail sauce or some a one. <laughs> <laughs> but then, uh, so then you can do the brain thing. Um, one of the latest things that uh, I really like to, to uh, use now that's been pretty successful for me is um, what they call boiling pinkies. I was just about to um, ask you <laughs> if that works. We've done that for some of the corn snakes. It hasn't worked for me at all. Yeah, we haven't been successful really? with the corn snakes, but we've tried. Well, you, yeah, you, you, but you got to try different amounts of time to mm -hmm. uh, boiling. I'm not quite sure what the, uh, like, you know, the physiological change in the pinky skin is occurring due to the boiling of them, but there's something happening there. Um, Cause like the first time I tried it was about three years ago and I had like 10 gray bands that wouldn't eat anything. I've tried, I, you know, they're the last holdouts that I had. I had tried everything I could possibly try on them. And then I heard about this boiling technique. So I thought, okay, well I'll give it a try. So I boiled up some water in a microwave and I, threw a handful of pinkies, you know, frozen thawed out pinkies again into a, this boiling water, took them out after, I don't know, like five or 10 seconds. Every single Alterna ate one. Whoa. I, mean, all 10. I thought this is, this can't be, um, it worked really good. Now it hasn't worked that good since it's just, it was just luck of the draw that it just happened, but it was enough to convince me that it, there's something there. Because these were alternative that I've tried on lizards. I mean, everything. And wow. they would not eat anything. Um, and they ate these bold pinkies. Now, since then, I've tried different amounts of time. Like, I'll get the water boiling, and I'll throw the pinkies in, and I'll count, like, you know, five seconds or eight seconds or ten seconds, different amounts of time. Because I've talked to um, uh, different people that have told me that they've tried it, too, and they had success using different amounts of time. So I've tried that. But I've, what I've found is that um, if you get the water boiling, I mean, a, a real brisk rolling boil in the microwave, immediately take them out, throw your pinkies in there for about five to six seconds, just one 1,000, two 1,000, you know, to, to about six. Then immediately, very quickly, dump them out into a little strainer and, you know, blow on them to cool them down quick because it kind of keep cooking if you don't cool them down quick. So I immediately try to cool them down as quick as I can. And then I, um, you know, dry them, you know, it just takes a second or two and they're just about to dry it off themselves anyway, because of the temperature. And then I, uh, put them back in there and I've had a lot of snakes eat boiled pinkies. I've got several that are eating boiled pinkies right now. 
Okay, we're gonna have to try that. Do a little. Yeah, I, I wrote it off a little bit just because it didn't work, but it's always good to have different things in your arsenal. different variables. Because I just boiled it till well, the, I don't know till I, I did guess. it two times. <laughs> One time was the boil the shit out of it, and the other time was the do it until the pinky was a little bit grayish colored. That's Maybe what that's I did it too. I seconds. remember when you were out of town, oh, I had to also. do it, and I did it till it like lost its color, kind of. Oh no! <laughs> yeah, that's how they look. If you do it, yeah, after you do it, they, they, that's what they kind of look like, kind of grayish. But um, I think that it really helps to try different actual precise amounts of time. So that way, at least it's controlled. You know what you you know what right. you got. So that way, if you do uh, get success, then you can duplicate that success later. You know what I mean? If you right. know what it takes. Um, then there's there's. Uh, well, there's a lot of other little techniques, weird things that you learn, I guess, over the years. There's the uh, motion, um, like uh, tease feeding. Mm -hmm. You know, you hold the pinky in front of their nose. And a lot of times, um, if they show interest, like usually if you're trying to feed a snake, like holding a pinky in tweezers, whether it's scented or boiled or whatever, uh, kind of stays on it, even if they're right. not eating it that usually shows that they're interested. Something's going on there. Now, if they just immediately turn away and try to find their hide box, yeah, they're they're not interested. But if they show any interest at all, then you can try different things. Like sometimes you can brush their neck, you know, like introduce a pinky to their nose, see if they show interest. And if they don't, just gently brush it down the side of their neck and body. And a lot of times they'll do uh, what's called like, a, um, like an impulse strike, you know, uh, they'll just immediately, you know, it's kind of like, um, I, I think it's, it's, um, it's something that's ingrained in them that when they're hunting baby lizards out there in the wild and, and a lizard runs by them, then they immediately turn to strike and grab it. So a lot of times if you get them interested in the scent of whatever you're trying to feed them and then brush alongside of them, that helps. And then you can also do things like a, a lot of them like to eat secretively. So um, I'll put the food item under their hide box and I'll sometimes lay a paper towel in their cage and put the pinky on the paper towel and then put their hide on top of the paper towel and then let the snake crawl into their hide box. And once they get in there in the darkness, you know, they'll eat. Um, you can put them in a deli cup with the, with the food item in a dark, you know, closet or something, leave them alone. Um, you can uh, put them in a paper bag. <laughs> One, I, I did this. Th I had heard this, uh, someone else's technique uh, of doing this, so I thought I'd try it one time. I bought a bunch of these little, uh, you know, brown paper sacks, like lunch sacks. Uh huh. And, and I put the snake in there with the pinky and then staple it shut. <laughs> what? And, <laughs> you know, and set it aside somewhere and then come back and check it later. And sure enough, some of them would eat that way. And you can also, and I've done this too, take them for a ride. What? Put them in a deli cup, or paper bag, and then set them on your car seat and then go driving around. <laughs> and the move, I'm telling you the truth. This is, I mean, I've tried everything. Um, but over the years, what I've, I've, I've developed certain techniques that, um, you know, that's what I stick to. And it's, you know, usually works out pretty good for me. Uh, but those are, you know, those are all different kind of techniques you can use. And depending on what you have that you're trying to um, get started eating, I mean, if it's a valuable animal, you want it to eat, you know, you'll do anything to get it going. Right now, going back to the lizards, what kind of lizard are you using and how are you sourcing lizards? Well, I go out and um, I collect them uh, the same place that I hunt gray bands. Usually, you know, I go out in the morning when the lizards come out and I catch the little uh, scaloparus that are out on the rock cuts. And uh, I'm not sure exactly. Uh, I think they're scaloparus merriami is what they're called. I don't know what their common name is. I think it's something like it might be a canyon swift or something like that. But those seem to be um, the best. But then there's others. Uh, just about any kind of lizard can work. And sometimes it doesn't have to be lizards from that they're used to in their habitat. I mean, you know, it can be something totally different. Like I've, uh, I've gotten some of them started on green anoles mm -hmm. that I've caught here in Fort Worth. Yeah. Cause I always wanted that. Cause I know we have here, we have a whole bunch of those 
invasive Mediterranean geckos. And I know people have used um, those for scenting. And then, of course, there's a Knolls here. And I think I looked up the genus. I think they call them sagebrush lizards. As far as or there, yeah, they're the the sagebrush lizards. I'm pretty sure the genus is Scoloporus. Mm -hmm. uh, it's still in that swift Scoloporus fence lizard family. Um, I just I don't remember what their species name is, uh, but any of those can work. But they don't all work. Is the thing. I mean, there's no one. Uh, I don't know what you call it. You know. Uh, you know, there's not one that, that one fits all type of, mm -hmm. you know, uh, um, Uda's side blotch lizards can work real good too sometimes. Now, is there any difference in um, feeding preference by locality? Uh, that, I, I think there is a little bit. I mean, I, I mean, again... You know, I, I always have to keep saying everything that I'm saying is not necessarily carved in stone. It's just my right. own observations and my own, you know, what I've what I think or what I've kind of seen. And yeah, there's a little bit. It seems like the alterna from the eastern um, areas tend to be generally more um, easier than the western ones. Um, and I know like some of the Western ones, I know that one of the common lizards out like in, uh, um, you know, near El Paso area is the side blotch lizard and the whiptail lizard. Uh, whereas you get, you know, more to the east, you get more of the scoloporous type of lizards. Okay. So, and uh, then, I, you know. yeah, I'll ask you a super objective, just your opinion question now. What's your favorite locality? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I, I don't really have a... Because um, each of the, of the localities that I'm working with, there's certain things about them that I like. Um, I guess one of them that I'm most partial to is my uh, uh, FM 2886 locality. Uh, You're gonna have to explain. Yeah, because I to I there. totally know what that means. FM twenty eight sixty six. Yeah. Well, well, FM is stands for um, farm to market road. And uh, we were by there. Farm to market road. Oh. Farm to market road twenty eight eighty six. Uh, and it's it's a road that um, it's uh, it it goes from uh, Terrell County up through Pecos County and ends up at. Uh, I-10 and it's, it's just a short, probably about a 40, 50 mile stretch of road, but there's only a couple of rock cuts on that whole stretch. And, uh, I've been lucky enough to find some alterna there. Um, so, uh, that's kind of one of my favorites cause they're really neat looking. Now what's the, what's the general look of those? Um, they're the, most of them that I've found up there, which is, well, I've only found two, but one of them was a gravid female and, all the babies came out looking pretty similar. They're kind of light gray, real nice, um, like a battleship gray, and narrow black bands with some of them have just small amounts of red in them. Okay, so are you are you partial to that look, uh, the gray and black look, or the highly patterned ones, or Blair's phase? Do you have any? You just like all of them? I think... Um... If I was to pick one phase over another, I'd have to say that yeah, I'm I'm probably partial to the uh, light phase alterna more than I am. Oops, hold on a second here. I'm in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I'm just moving to a room with better light, or trying to anyway. <laughs> now we understand. Is that better? Yeah. Um, I um I like them all actually. <laughs> you know, that's that's part of my problem. Uh you know, I like a nice light phase with nice orange. Um but then I like the intermediate phases, the ones that have the nice orange but spots in between, and then I like the ones that have no orange at all. Mm -hmm. Now, are the mutations to... Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say but if I really had to 
pick one over another, I'd probably say that the uh, uh, the alternomorphs that have the narrow black bands are my favorite. Mm -hmm. Now, are you in? Do you find that the leucistic? Because I mean, that's kind of taking away everything you like about gray bands. They're just turning them white. Do you do that to complete the puzzle of your Alterna collection, or do you just okay? Like you're breaking up. up. Oh, can you hear me? Are you there? Can you hear us? Yep, I can hear you. Are you back? Yes. Yeah, so as far as the mutations go, is like the leucistic gray band isn't exactly anything you'd look for in gray bands, obviously, if it's a white snake. Is that yeah. to is that to like complete your puzzle or do they have a, a different place um, kind of in your heart? I don't know. I just I, what happened was I had some um I, I had known of them for several years, but I never tried to get any of them. Uh, only because I just wasn't interested in the, um, you know, the mutant morphs uh, as much as I was just the natural animals. Um, but I had an opportunity to get some and I thought, well, you know, they're kind of neat. It'd be fun to work with them. So that's the only reason I got some. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, you can see that the hats kind of in parentheses are very, very washed out. Can you tell every het from non het well, um, no, you can't. Um, one of the characteristics of the the leucistic hets is that they uh, they tend to be visual hets, you, you know, for the most part. Um, but I have produced some that I know were 100% het because they were fathered by a visual leucistic that just looked like a really nice looking Blair's phase alternate. Mm -hmm. Um that don't have that hypo look to them. So I'm, I'm sure that, um, you know, as I produce more, I'll be able to get a better feel for that, but apparently they don't all show it. Okay. Now if we get more specific, I guess, um, on keeping wise, what do you keep these guys in and what is about the temperature and humidity requirements? Um, I keep mine in a rack system with a three inch heat tape in the back of the rack. Uh, and it, the heat tapes usually set at about 82 to 83 degrees. So the front of the, of their, uh, tub is usually room temperature, which runs about 75, 76 degrees. So that way they have a, a variation in temperature that they can thermoregulate. These are, these are generally, generally cooler than a lot of the, your other species. Yeah. Um, well, uh, what I've learned over the years is a lot of species that were once thought to require warmer temperatures don't require warmer temperatures. What they really require is vari variation in temperature. That's really what they need. I mean, back in the day, um, I used to just keep my snake room at 80 degrees. You know, thinking, oh, okay, that's, you know, one size fits all. And um, the, lucky just to keep my snakes alive. <laughs> um, but when I got, you know, over the years, as I, you know, got a little bit more savvy and, and um, interested in breeding and uh, learning more about their behavior and what the requirements really are and spending a lot of time in the field, you know, then I've developed, uh, you know, a lot of different ideas about how to, how to do that mm -hmm. and what the requirements really are. Right. So that's over time. Cause like you said, you're taking temperatures and things when you see snakes out at a certain temperature, that's kind of how you gauged where to put it in captivity. Um, yeah, pretty much, but also, um, these snakes, um, are found on rocks a lot. Not always. Hey, Hey, I got it. Attend to the bird. bird. <laughs> I was just about to ask you about that. <laughs> I'm sure people want to yeah. see the birds if you're going to go see them. So, because <laughs> people are asking no, no, to no. see stuff, but I'm trying to put them to sleep so we can do this. Uh, but they got upset because I turned the light on to try to get better lighting in here, and then they think it's time to get up. <laughs> but um, do they make that noise constantly? No, uh -uh. no, notice they're quiet now because I turned okay. the light off. 
No, and uh, yeah, talking about birds real quick, we'll just kind of shift gears here. What yeah. the funny thing is about them is that um, everybody thinks they're noisy because every time they hear them, they see them, they're noisy. Mm -hmm. Well, they're not. They're only noisy when they have a reason. Like if they're uh, first get up in the morning and they're hungry, they'll get to yapping. Or at nighttime, they'll get, you know, a little, like they're like kids or something. You know, they get a little, little you know. Yeah, agitated. but kids grow out of it. They become I adults. Know. These birds stay the Oh, yeah. Same. Well, that's, yeah. No, no, no. The parrots never do. They're like uh, <laughs> perpetual two year olds. <laughs> they, 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 I mean, for 80 years, for 80 years, they're oh, like a two year old. <laughs> so, so terrible. I'm sorry. Oh, I know. And like during the day, as long as their needs um, are and requirements are fulfilled, they're generally pretty quiet. You know, they'll get a little excited here and there. You know, somebody new comes into the room, they get excited. But when I'm just sitting in there, you know, reading the newspaper or watching TV or feeding somebody or something or in and out of the snake room, they're quiet. So it's, it's not that big a deal. <laughs> but um, uh, anyways, getting back to the temperature requirements and, and, and husbandry of the gray bands, um, they tend to come out on the rocks on these rock cuts um, at night. And I've developed all kinds of, you know, off the wall theories about all of that over the years. And uh, I've, I've taken temperatures of the rocks on the rock cuts as well as ambient, just air temperature and uh, temperatures out on the roads when I find these snakes and find that there's different temperatures. Like a lot of times the rocks will retain heat from the sun during the day longer than um, the roads or longer than, you know, the ambient temperature stays warm. So like the, the ambient might be, um, you know, 72 degrees, but you take the temperature on the rock cuts and it's like uh, 78, you know? Um, and then it started, you know, that's when it, it occurred to me that, yeah, okay, the snakes are out on those rock cuts for a couple of reasons. One to stay warmer and also to hunt for lizards. Right. So, you know, those are the kind of things that gave me ideas to give different, temperatures to the snakes and i started you know as also the the technology and the hobby improved and you know people started producing some of this you know really cool stuff that we have now like this heat tape that you can you know warm up cages with it's like paper thin and um you know you can adjust it with variable with thermostats and all this neat technical equipment so we didn't have any of that back in the day in fact when i first started using heat tape i had to make all my own uh, thermostats and I made them actually out of rheostats, you know, those dimmer switches, right? I'll be, um, go to the, uh, hardware store and buy dimmer switches and, and, and build uh, dimmer switches. But those, you know, you had to adjust them manually. Right. Uh, and if your room temperature fluctuated at all, uh, then those tapes would fluctuate a little bit now with thermostats. And I mean, you know, I use herp stats in all my shelves. I mean, they're real precise and, um, it's real important that they have that opportunity to thermoregulate. Right. And what would, what do you start keeping them in as far as enclosures go? What did I start keeping them in? Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see. Well, I think back in the seventies, um, well, when I was a kid, I used to keep them in aquariums, but I didn't have gray bands. I had other types of snakes and lizards and all kinds of stuff. And I just I had aquariums. I had wooden cages that I built with, you know, plexiglass fronts and things like that. But then in the 70s, when I started actually keeping alterna and corn snakes and actually started breeding, um, I, I bought sweater plastic sweater boxes that were uh, kind of the, the early form of a Rubbermaid. I think it was before the Rubbermaid days. These were like hard plastic, but clear plastic boxes and i used uh you know the uh heat tapes that you can buy uh to wrap around your uh pipes. plumbing and pipes to yeah. keep them from freezing in the winter time and and try to find those in california okay <laughs> <laughs> it was impossible hardly to find them in california you know but you could go to places like michigan and upstate new york and you know every hardware They're everywhere They're everywhere yeah so uh, anyways i use those heat tapes and uh, built rheostats and then laid my sweater boxes on them. Mm -hmm. And that's what I used initially. Um, and, it, and it worked okay. I mean, I was, you know, I was breathing some stuff. And, um, but then, you know, uh, incubation, uh, you know, it's kicking my butt. You know, methods for incubating were 
pretty much unknown. Everything was, we were all just kind of shooting from the hip back then. You know, everybody was trying different methods, trying to incubate eggs, and some people were successful and some were not. So what were so you that, doing? Uh, um, I guess we'll start at the beginning of the breeding process, then we'll get into the incubation. But um, so brumation, what are you doing for these guys? Well, I cool them um, a pretty long time in the in the winter um, from about, oh, I usually go from Thanksgiving to spring break. Okay, and then what kind of temperatures are you keeping them at? And in Texas, how are you getting them down? Well, um, fortunately, the way my room is set up, I can just open the window a um, certain amount and you know, let, just let the cool air come in, and I shut off the, the vent from the central heat, um, and that cools my room down enough. And then I still set my uh, heat tapes um, at around like 55 degrees so that way if it gets too cold then you know i don't you know kill my snakes mm -hmm. and i i go for a, like a long brumation uh so, you know b mainly because i think that's I, I try to duplicate what they get in nature mm -hmm. you know and i know that um i've i've i know some guys that have like uh incub i mean uh brumation refrigerators and things i mean where they you know they'll have their snakes down at a certain you know like you know, 57 and a half degrees <laughs> for exactly, you know, 6.2 weeks and blah, blah, blah. But I, I, I'm, um, I used to be a little bit more precise, but then when I realized that doesn't necessarily produce success that, you know, sometimes, uh, just kind of duplicating what happens in nature. Some days there's warm days, some days there's cool days. Um, it's mainly just enough to keep them inactive and cool down long enough to, uh, you know, cause them to uh, ovulate and want to breed in the spring. Um, but I like to go for a nice long brumation from, like I say, Thanksgiving to spring break. Okay. Yeah. There Ready seems, there seems to be a couple camps as far as colubrids go. People who think that all your snakes are going, like once you get at that 60 degree range, that's where you get susceptible to different diseases and, viruses or whatever the hell's out there and then people who just let it swing and don't really care and both seem to work yeah so yeah yeah that's why i always fall back and say hey this is what works for me it's not necessarily the only way you know what i'm doing um is working really good for me mm. now does that work across your species uh all the different clubbers you have including like something like your hog nose yeah yeah i pretty much do the same thing with my hog noses um um, and all my milk snakes, I've got a lot of milk snakes. Um, now some of them, like my Honduran milk snakes, I bump their temperature up just a little bit. Like instead of having it at 55, I think there's there, I got to look at the rackets and set it 60 or 65, but I still give them kind of a long brumation. Okay. And then I guess just clarification for people who aren't like, uh, that deep into colubrids, you are, are you totally cutting off photo period and not feeding at all? Um, I'm not feeding at all, but, um, again, in my room, my snake room gets some sunlight. I mean, I've got blinds, but I mean, during the day, you know, the room lights up a little bit and I don't know if that really helps or not. Um, but you know, again, I allow it right. and it seems to work for me. <laughs> yeah. As long as it works now, you're bringing these animals out of brumation. Um, what's your feeding like once you take them out? Well, I usually um, start them up pretty quick. I mean, once I warm them up, you know, within a week, I start introducing food. And usually about 80 or 90 percent of them will take food right away. Uh, some might hold out, you know, till the second feeding. But they usually always, all my breeders anyway, usually start feeding right away. Um, and, you know, I get a couple of meals in them. And then uh, usually the uh, females will go into a shed pretty quick. And um, once they shed is when I introduce the males. And they'll usually breed after the first or second shed. Okay. And the what shed is cycle? Is, I just can say the shed cycle seems to be a, a real um, critical indicator of uh, whether the you know, female is ready to breed or not. Mm -hmm. Now, what are you using as a marker to when a female is ready to breed? Um, oops. Uh, 
Well, a lot of times you can feel the um, egg follicles in the female if she's ovulated. And, um, you know, if you gently, like, let her just crawl through your hands, you can kind of put your fingertips on her belly and uh, just put real slight pressure there. She crawls through your fingers, and you can usually feel the eggs, but not always. And, you have actually, a, I mean, I a certain to... size that you feel comfortable with breeding them at? No. No, the size of that snake? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah generally. But, again, um, the gray bands vary a lot. Like, I know the western uh, species tend to be a little smaller. And, and I used to think that, well, they, you know, they're only going to breed at a certain size and they got to be big and blah, blah, blah. Well, I had some snakes that were small. Ball and I've happened to be cleaning cages follicles when it's to mail to them, mm. and um and they produce they just produce smaller you know number of eggs like three or four eggs, uh so then so now I, I I've changed over the years the thoughts about that um you know that they don't necessarily have to be a particular size. Uh, because some of them are just not going to get big. Right. Right. And then you're... Um... I, also, I, I also don't check for egg follicles that much anymore either. I mean, if I happen to be cleaning a cage and I know a snake should be ovulating, I might check. But I don't really anymore because I kind of go by the shed cycles. Okay. And then... Um, as far as introducing males, are you visually seeing locks pretty quick? And then once they're done taking them out, are you leaving them in there for a certain amount of time? Well, I've, again, that's something I've changed over the years. I used to like, you know, sit there and watch and document and, you know, how long that they're locked up and all this stuff. And I just, I stopped doing that. I'll just introduce the male to the female's cage. And sometimes, you know, you'll see courtship immediately start occurring uh, if they're, you know, if everything's right. But sometimes mm -hmm. it's not, and I, they just kind of go to neutral corners. I'll just leave them in there for sometimes a couple of days. Like I, I kind of have a routine now where when it's breeding season, um, I'll feed everybody, and then I'll let everybody digest for a couple of days because I don't want to, you know, get them stirred up too much right after they ate a big meal. So I'll maybe give them a couple of days to digest, then introduce the male to the female's cage for a, a day or two, and then by then it's time to feed again. So I separate them, feed them again, and do the, you know, repeat. So where does that land you as far as how often are those females being fed? Um, well, the females, well, almost all my snakes is, is um, the feeding schedule is about every, probably about six to seven days, maybe for adults. Okay. And then, so um, like, yeah, go ahead. So, yeah. So, I mean, to, to kind of break that down then is like, you know, I'll feed them. And then say maybe three days later, I'll introduce a male and leave them in there for maybe two or three days and then separate them. And that's, that's six days and then, you know, feed them again. Okay. And then how long can you see the period from that first courtship, you know, maybe that second shed to when she's laying eggs? Um, well, a lot of times, but not always, but most of the times you'll see a change in the body shape of the female um you'll if you took a cross section of the body you get what they call like a pear-shaped appearance where the the backbone will kind of poke out and the sides will kind of uh kind of i don't know expand out a little bit um so you can kind of tell sometimes that way sometimes you can uh, again you can feel the eggs if you're real um careful uh, you can, you know, let her slide through your fingers and you can feel them. Sometimes you can just kind of hold them up and you can just look at the, like the, the posterior third of the body. It's just going to look a lot bigger than the, you know, the front uh, part of the body. Okay. And how big are, is an average clutch size? Uh, I've, I've done averages on my clutches in the past and I, I just can't remember the exact number right off the top, but I would say probably around six to seven seems to be about average. Okay. You, know, you get those that I've, I've had like astronomically large clutches before, but that's a real rarity. You know, I've had like, uh, as many as I think 16 or 17 eggs. Um, and I've got like one female that consistently will lay 12 to 14 eggs every year. 
but then I've got others that lay four. Mm -hmm. That's a that's a lot smaller than I thought it was. Yeah, going I thought it, I didn't think it was going to be that small at all. Yeah, yeah the, I mean, the, uh, yeah. but the babies tend to be pretty big too. Really, you know, it's unlike say like uh, something similar in size like a corn snake. You know, might like twenty eggs, mm -hmm. but the eggs are all pretty small, uh, and the babies will be a little bit smaller. But the alterna, um, they tend to have pretty big babies. Mm -hmm. You know, eight to ten inches usually consistently okay i have a question yeah. unless you have more breeding questions no no go ahead we went okay the whole... yeah. um i don't know how to phrase this but what are your thoughts on when people say uh miami okatees are the the knockoff gray vans oh he may not know the corn snake talk oh <laughs> well i know what an okatee is but yeah you mean like that's like the top of the line of corn snakes or something? No, I, can, I breed. I can show you a picture. I breed uh, Miami, this Miami Okatee hybrid that yeah. basically, you know, mixture of the localities. And it makes an animal that looks kind of like a gray banded king snake. Oh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, I know what you're talking about now. Yeah, I've seen something similar. What about it? I don't mean so that. we breed them and, and people will be like, oh, are you having any gray rands this year? I'm like, well, no, but we have one that looks, <laughs> they were like, no, but we have one that looks similar. They're like, oh, that's just the knockoff. Like, or people are like, that I don't, rands. yeah, people viewed as the, uh, the knockoff. So for everyone, <laughs> I don't know if I could show a good picture. No, it's just, you know, it's just a gray. Oh, no, okay. That's good. That just looks yeah, like yeah, a yeah, mammy. No, I've seen... a yeah. Um, well, and plus, it, it looks more like a red milk snake in a way. That's true, yeah. It does you look know? like a milk snake. But, um, I mean, but see, that's the, that's the, the, you know, going back to what we talked about way earlier, that the change in this hobby, there's so much stuff being bred now um, that, I mean, I, you know, I mean, it doesn't, I don't have an opinion or judgment on it one way or the other because there's just so much stuff out there. It's just a matter of preference of what, what you like. And, and how, like, some people don't care if they ever find a gray band in the wild. Mm -hmm. But, you know, they, they want to have some. You know, right. but they're never going to, you know, like somebody that lives in Pennsylvania or whatever, they're not going to, you know, they, they already know that it, it would be probably uh, uh, futile <laughs> to hop in a car and spend two weeks on the road. <laughs> you know, a ton of money and a ton of gas and a ton of effort. And, you know, they could, for the same amount of money, they could go to the, the Herp show and, you know, buy a dozen Alterna. <laughs> right. I think it's uh, it's definitely shifted to where the Internet makes it a lot easier for you to find these kinds of things. I think back probably when you started, the people who were into it were the people who were like all the way into it. Nowadays, you have people who are just into snakes and captivity, but yeah. people, you know, back in the day in the seventies and eighties, I felt like those were the hardcore people and people that always were in the field and always doing that and always had that connection of well, back in, snakes. That was the only way to get some of the stuff back then. We didn't have snake shows back in the seventies. I think the very first reptile show I ever went to was, I want to say the mid eighties, mid to late eighties. And that was in uh, Dallas here. I was in Oklahoma at the time and uh, drove down here to go to it. That was like one of the very first ones, but back in the seventies and, and earlier, I mean, the only way you're going to find any of this stuff is go out to the field. It had a small, it was more of just a, a small amount and little nucleus of really hardcore uh, gray band aficionados. But then, like you say, with the advent of the internet and, um, you know, breeding to, you know, breeding information is more available and everybody started producing stuff and the whole industry changed. Yeah, was there even any type of focus as far as captive breeding, or are you just trying to keep them alive? Well, the, initially it was just the challenge was just trying to keep them alive because, like I say, nothing was known about uh, gray band, just like nothing was known about a lot of other herps either back then. Um, you know, like optimum temperatures and um, frequency of feedings and all that kind of stuff. Um, so that was the challenge with just keeping them alive. But once you mastered that, then the next reproduce them in captivity, you know, cause mm -hmm. they were so hard to find 
Um, and back then also they're very expensive. Even if you found one available to buy, it was usually pretty expensive. And then again, you always ran the risk back then as to why is somebody wanting to sell an adult gray band? You know, there's something probably wrong with it. That's so, what he tells me all the time. Even, days, even now, I'm like, oh, I only want to buy an adult because I don't want to wait to I like breed it. Babies. Like, I'm like, I just want to buy it and breed it. And he's like, no, anyone who's selling an adult is selling it because there's something wrong with it. Well, I'll tell you, that's that's my feeling, too. I mean, the industry has changed and I've grown up with this whole industry and I've seen all the different changes and, and I've gone from being just, you know, a young collector to, you know, um, somebody that does shows now. And I've, I've talked to so many different people and I've seen so much different stuff and all this internet sales. I've been a victim of buying snakes on the internet <laughs> that I regret it. Oh, no. Because I, you know, they're just, they weren't represented well and, you know, there's something wrong with, with them. And that's happened to me a couple of times. And I've spent a couple of times some, you know, pretty fair amount of money so that's why now I subscribe to that philosophy, too, that if somebody's selling an adult snake, not always. I, I mean, I, I can't say always, but I always have to ask what's wrong with it. Because <laughs> if it was an adult snake, I mean, why wouldn't they want to keep it and, you know, use it as, a, you know, one of their breeders or something? Yeah. So I, I'd really rather get, you know, the, the babies and raise them up than, you know, that they're healthy. Mm -hmm. So Evan on the chat was wondering, um, like, you know, we have certain viruses that are linked with species as far as, you know, corn snakes Fizzy. and crypto or Morelia is getting nidovirus Fizzy. and stuff like that. Are there any neurological issues or viruses or anything all, uh, Alterna are prone to? Uh, the only thing that I've ever really noticed um, with Alterna that seems to you know, that that shows up more than, you know, a little bit is uh, respiratory problems. You know, that that's about it. Um, I've, I've not heard or seen of any, like, uh, specific virus or disease that attacks Alterna, like, you know, Zonata disease and things like that. Um, but I have seen some of them develop respiratory problems if their housing isn't adequate like it's you know maybe too humid not adequate ventilation because they're from a pretty dry area so what are the ways and, that and you ensure that they don't get too humid well you got to have make sure that the uh the the housing that you're providing is well ventilated for them you know they're um whatever kind of cage you're keeping them in. I keep mine in, you know, plastic tubs in a rack system and I drill holes in the tubs. Um, some of my rack systems have enough of a gap at the top of the tub between the shelves that allows for ample ventilation. But a lot of, uh, a lot of them I've drilled additional holes. Um, but also the um, different parts of the country have uh, are more humid than others so that makes i think keeping them a little more challenging um, also depending on your uh, heating and ventilation in your house where you're keeping them can make a difference you know if you're uh, like you know i have um, central heat and air in my house and it keeps the humidity pretty low in the house even during times when the outside air humidity is pretty high Okay. And now for, for, for the eggs, are there considerations there too? As far as what, humidity? Um, yeah, as far as incubation, is it the same as most colubrid eggs or are there special uh, requirements? Um, no, I, 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 I incubate my gray bands about the same as I do my uh, um, uh, like hog nose snakes and milk snakes. Um, you know, I, I've Again, I've kind of gone, I've gone back and forth over the years with different ways to incubate, and uh, I found that snake eggs can be incubated in a much drier, um, you know, lower humidity than than I ever used to think. Um, so I keep my substrate, you know, pretty dry mm -hmm. when I incubate. And what are you using for substrate? 
um, perlite, you know, that, uh, um, that white kind of powdery looking stuff that people use in planters and mix in with potting soil and stuff. Right. That's, I just use pure right. perlite. Now, again, you know, that's not the only, you know, thing that you can use. I've seen people successful using, uh, all kinds of other different substrate. Um, I like the perlite because it's, um, it'll retain moisture without feeling wet on the outside. So like, so you can, uh, you know, you mix your water with your perlite and get the right mixture going and then put it in your, um, whatever, you know, you're going to use to incubate your eggs in. And then I just set my eggs right on top of the perlite. And, uh, so they really have very little contact with moisture. And then, you know, of course, I'll watch them through the incubation period. And if, if I, you know, feel like it's getting too dry, I might add a little bit of water. How long do you usually see these guys um, incubate for? Uh, generally about 70 days. Um, but I, I let my uh, eggs temperatures fluctuate a little bit with the room. Um, again, I, I used to have an incubation uh, closet that was insulated and temperature controlled and I kept it at precisely 80 degrees or 81. I don't remember what I kept it at, right. but, um, I, 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 over the years I, I've not gotten lackadaisical, but I think that it's not as critical as I once thought to keep them at a particular temperature. And again, I'm not commercial, so I'm not trying to push them to hatch them early. Like some people uh, I do know do that, that take the snakes out of hibernation early, breed them early crank up the temperature and in incubation, try to get those eggs hatching quicker. Um, but I, I don't, I just let mine incubate at room temperature and on the top of my reptile shelves, it generally stays about 78 degrees during the summer. It'll drop a little bit at night and it'll sometimes get a little warmer during the day. So it fluctuates, I don't know, probably between six at night to sometimes 81 or 82 during the day but generally stays about somewhere around 78. Okay. And that, of course, okay. that determines the length of, you know, uh, if you crank up the temperature to about 81 or 82, they'll hatch in, you know, like about 63 or 64 days. Right. So now I guess we can talk about, all the other things you keep. So <laughs> do you keep all, is uh, everything that you keep colubrids? Uh, let's see. Yeah. Yeah. Now, yeah, that's it. Just milk snakes, gray bands and hog nose. Someone asked earlier if you have any black milks. No, I used to, I, I, I used to keep those and breed them and raise them. And, um, they're neat, but, uh, over the, the years, uh, as, as my collection of gray bands and some of the locality milk snakes I'm working with, as my collection grew in those areas, um, I had to cut back in other areas because I just didn't have the time and the space to do everything I wanted to do. And so those eventually got cut. I had there... black milks. I had um, some other South American milks. Uh, what other... Several others that I was working with for a while, Pueblin milk snakes, and I mean I like all that stuff, but I can only keep so much. Mm -hmm. Are there any projects or species that you cut out or got rid of that you wish you could get back? <laughs> uh, no, not really, um, because I pretty much over the years I've, I've, I've pretty much just kept the ones that I've really like. I, 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 I don't tend to um, like switch around to whatever's popular. You know what I mean? Um, I've kept Sinaloan milk snakes for 30 years. I've had gray bands for 40 years. I've been, I mean, I, I don't have some that are 40 years old, but <laughs> uh, I've been, I've been keeping gray bands. You know, they're, they're one of my favorites mm -hmm. for you know a long time. And, uh, Sinaloan milks, um, other types of milk snakes like, uh, um, New Mexico milks and the red milks and, um, Mexican milks and, you know, uh, Utah milks, things like that. I like, so I, I've kept those. And then the hog noses are probably my, my newest, 
uh, species that I started years ago. Mm -hmm. Um, those kind of interested me. So I started keeping those and, uh, and then as, as I had other things that, like I say, I had to make room for them. So I had to cut them out. Right. And I mean, let's elaborate on the hog nose thing. You, you, um, breed Westerns and you breed tricolors, correct? Right. Westerns, tricolors and Mexican hogs is what I'm oh, working so with right now. Everything but Easterns. Have you ever kept Easterns? No, I've found them before, but uh, they're a little bit more challenging. They tend to like amphibians a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the Western hogs tend to fit more into what I'm working with anyway, climate-wise, behaviorally, you know, habitat. They're from the same kind of general area as Alterna. I feel like most people have Westerns, yeah? Uh they seem to be the most common in the pet industry because I think they were one of the first that was really exploited and bred, you know, successfully. And, you know, so they got out there quite a bit. Now, and I mean, a lot of more popped up. Um, yeah, I know the morphs, once morphs come, people love everything, mm -hmm. but, um, that seems to be how it works with most of the species. Yeah. As soon as the morphs yeah. start popping up, then it's like, baseball cards you know you got to have one of each <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean that's also that's almost what turns me away with a lot of species what that's why that's why i like jungle carpets because <laughs> there's no morph jungle carpets. Oh, but we have corns yeah but that's just fun like, those are so that's, that's like fun. the most morphs ever <laughs> But then you have the other stuff that's like it's always going to be in its purest form, and I appreciate the purest form. And what I like about jungles and stuff like that is people. There's more people focus on like line breeding for a specific look, and I think that's cool because there like there isn't like let me get this morph, let me get this morph, let me get this morph, let me just get the best. People are never satisfied with the. They always go a different direction. Every right year. when there's all those morphs, but when there's just one, it's like let me get the yellowest or the most black. And I think that's a, that's a cool thing. Cause you don't see that in, you know, like corns where it there's so many different morphs. People aren't and... focusing on one and trying to get, they, they're trying to get the best, but not as much as in like jungles and stuff. Yeah. That makes sense. <laughs> I, I think there's like a, you know, you can, there's like a happy medium. I mean, you can, it, it, it's kind of like what I'm doing. Um, my Alterna for the most part, are, they're all locality specific. Um, and there's different variations, but not that many different morphs. But then on the hog noses, they're a lot of fun because there are a lot of different kind of morphs that you can produce out of, you know, small amounts of, of, of animals, but I'm not trying to get all the hog nose morphs. I only like, uh, just a few of them. And so that's what I work with. And the same with like Honduran milk snakes. I like Honduran milk snakes, but I'm only working with a couple of the morphs cause that's just what I like. Right. Yeah, I think people no. get stuck in the um, always going, getting the new thing, which ends up just being really expensive, which prices me out anyway. That's probably why I don't like morphs. Get oh, cheap. <laughs> well, what, what usually happens anyway, what always happened to me was that I was always late getting into stuff, you know, because I'd see some new morph and it'd be too expensive and I couldn't afford it. And I'd say, well, I don't, I'm not going to get it. And then the price starts to come down a little bit. And I think, ah, oh, maybe I should get them. So then I get some, and then by the time, you know, two, three, four years it takes to raise something up, to breed it, you know, thinking, I'm, I'm thinking, oh, I'll make my money back. By the time I get to breeding them, you can't give them away because <laughs> everybody's right. got them. <laughs> so I, I learned that a long time ago. So uh, I, now I just, I just keep what I like, and mm -hmm. that's what I breed. And I don't care, you know, if, if the prices drop, I'll still keep what I have. Now I'm wondering – is there is there any reason why the tricolors haven't seemed to catch on a lot? And because I mean, they're just as personable as say seem as personable as a regular Western hog nose, and they look a lot cooler than Western hog nose. Um, is do you think there's any yeah. reason they haven't? Well, yeah, yeah, because um, they uh, they haven't been around as long. Um, I know that like, oh, I think the first time that I saw some was probably, I don't know, 10 or 15 years ago, and they're real expensive. The first ones that I ever saw available were somewhere around seven or $800 a piece. 
and I knew nothing about them at the time. They're from South America and there was very little information out there. So I just wasn't about to jump out there and, you know, spend a couple thousand dollars to, to get, you know, a, a couple of them, um, without knowing more about them. So I just, I didn't. And then, um, uh, until people started, you know, producing them and they made them more available and the prices came down a little bit and information got out there on how to take care of them. Um, you know, that, that helped too, but there's something different about them too. I don't, I think their mortality rate is a little higher than Western hogs. So I think some people that, uh, you know, that are working with them, um, you know, it's a little bit challenging to try to keep your populations up there and, reproducing because i think that uh what i've heard anyway from some people is that they um you know they'll uh, you can raise them up they raise up quick uh but then they um you know they burn out quick you know a couple of two mm -hmm. or three years might just you look in the cage and they roll over and they're dead because uh, yeah because i've heard people say them, that they I'm breed just, often them. yeah yeah i've had i've had some triple clutch um on me already. Wow. And I just started working with them a couple of years ago. Uh, but I, I think you're going to see a lot more of them in the pet trade because they're, they're getting kind of more popular again. I think the price kind of got down there to where more people got them. Uh, information got out there on how to take care of them and reproduce them. So that's helping. Um, so it's, you know, kind of an exponential kind of thing that You'll, you'll see more of them, I think. Do you suspect that that's a husbandry issue as far as them dropping yet? Maybe there's something that we don't understand yet? I don't really know. I don't claim to know that much about them, tell you the truth, other mm -hmm. than from you know some of the other people that I've, I've talked to and just you know listening to you know what their experiences have been with them. Right. So it could be. It could very well be that it just... Uh, but then again, too, I mean, maybe they're just a prolific breeder and and that's their way of surviving is that they they don't live real long, but they produce a lot quickly. And you know, maybe that's that's all the answer is. I don't know. Yeah, but I like them. They're neat. Yeah. Do you see any behavioral differences between them and say Westerns and Mexican uh, the Mexican ones? Um. Well, so far, the tricolored hogs that I've hatched out have been really small. And so they're really hard to get started. Uh, I'm, uh, you know, I've really had to kind of really use all the different tricks that I know how because they're so small. Like a couple of them, I started out just tailing uh, fuzzy mouse tails because they were too small to eat anything. Um, I got a couple of mouse tails and got a little bit of size. I could get them to take a pinky head scented with lizard <laughs> and then after you know half a dozen pinky heads some of them were big enough to take a newborn pinky so it was a real struggle so i'm really hoping but i i think some of that might be because uh the animals i'm working with are young and small and they started producing eggs at a, a real early age i'm hoping once they get a little bit more size on them rather than have large clutches i hope they have larger eggs <laughs> and bigger babies that are easier to work with yeah what how young is young um, well, I had one breed at, uh, gosh, I want to say, uh, probably about 15 months. Wow. For I think a triple, yeah. And, oh, and I wasn't even going to breed it. That. I wasn't going to breed it, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I was cleaning the cage and, and I, I, again, I was just letting her slip through my fingers and I felt eggs and I thought, wow, this snake is just, I mean, it's, I've just barely had it a year already I'm feeling follicles. So I thought, well, I mean, if, you know, nature is doing its thing, I mean, she should be ready. So I introduced her to a male and they locked up and she had eggs and she had two more clutches. She triple clutched that last year. And this was just a really small snake. So I'm really hoping now that she's a little bit bigger, she'll have, a, you know, some bigger eggs. And but I there... think you're going to see a lot more there. Was there any seasonality to that as far as was she in any type of a cycle temperature wise? Um, no, actually, when she bred last year, I hadn't uh, brumated her at all because I wasn't expecting her to breed. And so I kept her up with, you know, all my other small snakes. I don't hibernate all my snakes. I, the ones that are just growing up, I try to keep them up through the winter and keep feeding them to right. get size on them. 
Now we we're tracking back. Um, someone on the chat, Evan said, um, "What are your thoughts on crossing the locales of gray bands? Of which of gray bands?" <clears throat> well, you know, I mean, there's all different kinds of people that are in this hobby nowadays. And, um, you know, some people want to do that. That's, you know, hey, that's their business. I don't um, I don't promote it because I like to keep the localities. When you got something locality specific, that makes it special. And, you know, so it's best to try to keep it as pure as you can. But sometimes some people don't have enough locality animals to breed one locality they might have a you know a male from valverde county and a female from terrell county and so that's all they got they make so it happen they got, they're gonna breed them and yeah. as long as they don't misrepresent it and sell try to sell babies um i don't really see anything you know as long as they sell the babies as generics mm -hmm. then i don't so, see anything wrong with that so do you have the same view about hybrids uh, hybrids what um, across yeah, species much. in I general mean, yeah i mean i i don't i don't know i know some everybody's got opinions about stuff and i don't the hobby is has gotten so diverse see i mean you know when you're talking to me i mean i you know i i was keeping snakes back in the 60s i mean that was like the stone age compared to now. <laughs> we, i mean we like i said it was challenging just to you know keep them alive um but there's so many different kinds of people nowadays and so many different animals out there and so many different ideas and opinions on what people want and want to do that. Uh, I guess, you know, if they want to produce hybrids, I mean, no, I mean, you're not going to stop them. They so might as well accept it. And, you know, right. <laughs> I mean, you got like these jungle corns, what corn snakes. Yeah. Are. <laughs> I hate snakes so and, much. He, and he's a, He's a big against hybrids. <laughs> and then, well, I mean, I, I'm not, like I said, I'm not all for it, but I'm not really against it only because there's just so much just of it out there. I mean, it's like, huh? I I just won't buy yeah. it. I mean, if you want to do it, that sounds fun, I guess. Oh, yeah, that's, yeah, it's just, it's not something I want. I don't mm -hmm. want it. It's like um, Imperial Milk Snakes. I think it's called a Imperial something. It's like a cross between a, a Cal King and a Pueblin Milk <laughs> And something else, I can't. I can't remember. I saw one of those one time, and I thought, "Wow, this is really weird looking." Um, but you know, I can kind of see that if this continues, uh, who knows what it's going to be like in fifty more years or a hundred years? You know, I mean, the whole the, 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 there might be nothing but just domestic animals available anyway. Right. I mean, what dogs and cats. What scares me is that there's not a Stu Tennyson of our generation who has all the localities of gray bands. So it's like, if you're the only one doing it and you stop doing it, then what the hell happens to all these projects? You know what I mean? <laughs> well, there, there's some there's some young folks out there that that are uh, have the appreciation, you know, for the for the gray bands. It's just like. Um, uh, but, but the, yeah, there's, you know, there's just like a bunch of, there's, there's several of us old timers that are still kind of stuck in the past, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but there's, there's, there's a few, I think that are, you know, hopefully that will continue that, that locality interest and in keeping the stuff pure. Um, you know, I, I think you're going to, I think that's, I think you're going to still have that mm -hmm. just like you have purists in other areas too. Like in you know, green tree pythons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's yeah, there's green tree pythons. There's, and there almost all the species. You know, you got some people that are purists and just want to keep, you know, just real. Uh, where did I? I was just either just talking to somebody recently or just saw something or read something about that too, uh, where somebody was saying how they really like just the natural forms of stuff, you know. Mm hmm. So I think you're still going to have that. But, you know, the only thing that really worries me about it is the laws. Right. You know, the laws are getting tougher all over the country in all the different states. And I think that's going to have a big effect on a lot of this, too. I, you know, if you can't go out there and collect locality stuff anymore, you know, it's just probably going to be a matter of time that, you know, it's a lot of the localities are just going to 
be non-existent in the pet trade. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's this weird balance that we try to strike between not hurting wild populations. And then, you know, so we ban all the interstate trade of certain species. And then the people who actually go out and illegally catch the animals actually end up making more money. So there's actually more of a demand for people to go out there and break the law to put them into the hobby because now all of a sudden indigos are worth much more money than they were before. Yeah. So it's kind of a catch 22 always. Yeah. I, I, you know, now see, that's one thing. I mean, I have an opinion about, I think um, that captive bred reptiles should have a lot more leniency. Than absolutely. You know, I mean, they're, they're, <clears throat> I mean, it almost should be unrestricted. If you're reproducing something in captivity, I, I, I think, you know, you should just be able to sign an affidavit or something saying that this is produced in captivity and be able to sell it just to prevent what you just said. Right. You know, uh, like the illegal, it's kind of like, uh, you know, poaching of certain animals and things. You know, the only reason why, they're worth a lot of money is because it's illegal to have them, <laughs> right. you know, and if you make it legal, then it's not that big a deal anymore. Right. I mean, you just always, I don't see how it would get to a point, but somehow if there's a point to where you can't keep things like corn snakes and king snakes, I mean, you just be totally screwed as people <laughs> who, as humans who yeah. like nature and animals, you know, and keeping animals in captivity. And, you know. and, and I don't, yeah, I don't think that's going to change that much because there's too much out there already. And I'm sure that a lot of the different states, uh, fish and wildlife departments recognize that. I mean, cause it doesn't take a, a genius to go online and look at all the different, you know, stuff for sale. And uh, they know that there's just tons of stuff out there. But what they are doing little by little is, is some states are restricting, you know, how much you can collect from different localities and things. So, you know, that's going to have an effect over time, I think. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you're going to end up with uh, snakes are going to be bug-eyed and scaleless because <laughs> they're all <laughs> going to be inbred. <laughs> yeah, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, at this point, I mean, I don't know if we have many corns that aren't mixed with emery, which eventually aren't all going to be mixed with all these genes that have subtle malformalities in the mutations oh, and yeah. stuff like that. And well, I know, I like, guess. Yeah, I mean, that's happened with the, the Sinaloan milk snakes. Um, you know, I remember years ago when the Sinaloans were first being collected and brought into the country, they were pure locality Sinaloan milk snakes but then when somebody produced an albino Nelson's milk snake and started crossing them with Sinaloans just because they didn't have enough Nelson's to breed them to they mm -hmm. produced a whole bunch of integrades that are out in the pet trade now right. and you can't hardly tell one from another because there's been so much breeding going on um, that a lot of them look like a Sinaloan milk snake and they will key out as a Sinaloan milk snake but they'll produce albinos so you know they can't be pure Sinaloans. Um, but then, you know, also talking about like pricing and things like the indigo snakes, you know, um, if the regulations for breeding those in captivity was a little bit more lenient, the prices wouldn't be 800 to $1,000 a piece. Right. You know, which would not be good for the commercial person that's trying to sell them and make money at it but it would be better for the individuals that don't have a lot of money that want them. Right. And then the more people that it's available to in price, the more people are going to breed, the more captive population there is. And therefore there's much of a less of a need for us to, for anyone to collect them out of the okay. wild or go back to do exactly what yeah. that law is supposed to stop <laughs> from happening. I don't know. Well, I, don't, I think there's probably a lot of people out there that have gray bands, for instance, that, have never collected one and probably never will. Mm -hmm. I, I'd like to know. They the got it is, easily. Gonna... <clears throat> well, sure. Yeah. Because I mean, they're, you know, they got enough sense to know that it's a lot better to, you know, go to the snake show and buy one for 150 bucks mm -hmm. than it is to, you know, spend thousands and maybe find one or maybe not. 
Uh, but I'll, I'd like to see what the numbers are, but I'll bet you it's pretty significant. Right. You know, right. I'll bet you that. And, I, and it's probably the same for a lot of other species of snakes too, that you got people. Well, I know that I've, I've met lots of people that keep snakes, all kinds of different species that have never the wild mm -hmm. of what they're keeping. Well, I've yet to find a corn snake in the wild. <laughs> So, but I've barely <laughs> lived in their range, but I have found emery's and western rats. So, does that excuse me a little? Maybe I should a make, a, make a road trip to Florida or South Carolina. Well, I haven't found any um, albino hognose snakes yet in the wild, but <laughs> that'd be <laughs> but cool. I keep some of those. <laughs> <laughs> True. I mean, have you seen any type of, uh, other than crazy different looks of gray bands, have you seen any type of anything that you could call a mutation in the wild of other species? I personally haven't, you know, I, I've, I've never been lucky that way. I mean, um, right. I, I know people that have found like albinos <clears throat> of different species in the wild. Now, in my earlier days of collecting, I probably have found some that might have been a different morph or two, but did, didn't know it <laughs> uh, at the time. I just figured it was just a different, you know, shade of color or something. Right. <laughs> because yeah. growing up in California, there were places where I'd go snake hunting and I might see 50 snakes in a night. Really? So, uh, you know, yeah, out in the desert out there in Anza Borrego. Um, road driving back in the 60s you know you could find tons of snakes and some places you could field collect in hills and different places and find tons of snakes um, and I probably like I say a time or two may have seen like a who knows maybe a you know uh, anatheristic glossy snake or something you know just but just passed it off as a weird looking glossy snake but nowadays, you know, if I find something, I'm a little bit more careful and looking at it more closely. I think that's the hobby in general now. It's all fine tooth comb everything because there's potential yeah. financial gain or, you know, the fun involved in breeding out the mutation and stuff like that. And that's a whole nother angle of this whole hobby that we didn't really talk about too much is how much um, the uh, industry has been driven by by uh capitalism you know right it's had a big effect on the whole hobby too right you know a like, lot of people now they don't look at just something for face value like oh yeah i'd sure like to have this and set it up and this would be neat to have this particular animal now it's more like in invest in these animals <laughs> how much can i make in two years or something that's what right. they're looking at uh, so it's refreshing. Like I, I, I ran into a couple of people at the last snake show that were, um, uh, I forget what, I think they had, I don't know what they had either. Maybe it was poison dart frogs or something, but they showed me some of their setups at, that they had their animals in at home. And it was just incredible. You could tell that they just love these creatures and not necessarily for breeding. You know, they just had these little, um, uh, you know, terrarium set up just like just like beautiful little pieces of art out of the rainforest mm -hmm. <clears throat> so you could you know tell that they're really enthusiastic about just having the animals and having this natural looking thing but then you got you know some like some people that just want to mass produce stuff just to make money at it well that's what uh evan does who's been asking the gray band questions he does a lot of the naturalistic um bio whatever the hell they're called terrariums yeah. and i I just make fun of him because he breeds a lot of fruit flies and not a lot of snakes. So. <laughs> well, you're you're fruit stuck flies. breeding gotta fruit be a little flies. Bit, a little easier. At least it's easier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, so that's that's been his thing. And I mean, it is incredible, the enclosures yeah. and stuff. Oh, yeah. I've seen some people's enclosures that they've uh, produced. And I mean, it's just really cool looking. I, I've got a few right here in my living room I'm looking at that uh, some of those... Um, Oh, gosh, what's that brand of terrarium that's real popular now? Can't even think a of a glass the one. Of yeah, yeah, yeah. Glass. Oh, uh, zoom and not the uh, zoom ads. The uh, Exoterra. Yeah, I was going to uh -huh. get up here and see if I could. 
I don't know if you can see one of these. I don't know. Can you see any of that? I yeah. can see the TV. <laughs> <laughs> Over there? Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you can. Yeah, yeah, we can see it. Yeah. Uh, but they've been, uh, you know, it's kind of a, a little bit challenging trying to keep, you know, keeping those kind of cages clean. Right. Because uh, right. there's so many, you know, like I've got those um, those really neat little fake rock backgrounds in them and stuff. But then, you know, snake crawls up there and takes a crap and it dries on there. It's like almost impossible to really clean it off completely without taking it out and washing it. Yeah, it's like you got to choose your species wisely or else it gets unsanitary. That's why it's hard not yeah. to. You get so used to the convenience of keeping in tubs, I think. You know, it's hard. Oh, yeah. It's so easy, much easier to sanitize them, too. I mean, you know, you can, when you're switching snakes from one tub to another, you just take it out and wash it out. But mm -hmm. these uh, exoterras, all, you know, they look really cool when they're set up and clean and everything. Um, they're just kind of hard to keep up on. Right. Um, so, Stu, we have gone over two hours. <laughs> uh, I thank you for for being on and um, give us a little sure. rundown. Are there any projects or animals available or anything people can look for and where they can get in touch with you? Um, well, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm... I don't know if, if my contact information is available on there or on, uh, you know, your site, but I'm going to be at the NARBC uh, in Arlington next month. I'm going to have a table there. Cool. Um, and I've, I've got some, uh, let's see, what have I got? I've got a few things left from the season that are, they're, they're, they're not all uh, like the bottom of the barrel. There are a lot of them are, were holdbacks that have decided to let go and, or snakes that, you know, were hard to get started eating, so I didn't make them available until, you know, now. Um, but I've got, you know, about a dozen or so Alterna, um, some Western hogs, uh, tricolored hogs, Mexican hogs, a few milk snakes that I'll have there. Um, then this, this year I'm going to have some pretty neat stuff. Uh, more of a lot of the same and then plus you know i'm still working with the leucistic alterna and i've also recently started working with the uh the hypo and anatheristic uh, alterna from black gap mm -hmm. those are kind of neat and then various milk snakes i'm gonna have two wow. cool. um and then your facebook page is Stu's herps yeah Stu's herps yeah just Stu's Herps, and uh, anybody can get in contact with me through that. And do you have an Instagram? No, I do, <laughs> but I just, I don't, that's, that's too much tech. It gives me a headache. <laughs> <laughs> but there's also another uh, um, Alterna folks, Facebook Alterna folks. Okay. Uh, that's strictly just Alterna stuff. That if anybody's interested in, that's that's um, a place to go to just immerse themselves in Alterna. I awesome. bet Evan would love that. Evan's on there. I saw him in the. He's uh, already probably. in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's quite a few people on it already. Okay, wait. Sorry, Evan said something called Black Gap. Yeah, that's one of the localities he was talking about. Oh, sorry. <laughs> what, Evan's a Evan about been it dreaming. Or? Of he just going was, over to West just, Texas. Yeah, he just said Black Gap exclamation point. I think he just likes them. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Well, Black Gap's kind of an interesting locality um, because there's a lot of variation that comes out of that area. Uh, you get some that are just kind of average looking, and then you get some that are just phenomenal looking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I've seen, and and that's where a lot of, like you said, the mutations that, that hypo comes from. Yeah, the hypo and anatheristics. <clears throat> but really, if you um, if you look at the whole range, um, we, we never even really got into this that much, but there is an area that seems like from Black Gap North, that's why I, I spent a lot of time around Sanderson. Sanderson puts out a huge variety 
of uh, variations. And I like that area um, the best mm -hmm. of all the different localities because you can go to certain cuts and you'll never know what you're going to find. It's going to be different every time. Uh, but I, I think that there's that's partly what lends me to believe that what I said earlier about we're either looking at two species coming together or two species or one species separating. Because if you look at a line north and south from Black Gap kind of due north up through Sanderson, the whole area through there comes out with some really wild variations of Alterna. Whereas east and west of that north and south line, um, they tend to be, um, you know, whatever the locality is, they tend to look, you know, a little bit more similar in those areas, mm -hmm. I think. So now Evan got his. Oh, now okay, Evan's last asking the question. <laughs> oh. Sorry, but Evan asked you, um, when are you going fielding again? Field um, probably. <clears throat> I, I, I usually start going out around the, the end of May. Okay. Memorial weekend is kind of like my weekend that I, you know, kind of look at, but it's, it's really weather dependent. You know, if the if we get an early spring, then, you know, early May might be good. If it's a late spring, you know, late May, early June might be better. But once the season begins for Alterna, it can be good all the way through the summer. Okay. <clears throat> well, Evan's trying to uh, go herping with you. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing guided tours. <laughs> <laughs> No, well, if you want to pay for gas, <laughs> pay for yeah, tell him if he pays for gas, yeah, then I might, I might consider it. <laughs> I don't, I don't hunt as hard as I used to. I just go out for fun now, um, more than anything. Mm -hmm. Evan so. said, "Let's go," so I guess he's willing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, hopefully, I'm gonna go out there several times this summer. Awesome. I think we have to go. I'm going to go before we move away. Oh, yeah? Okay. Yeah, why not? Okay. I'll go with Evan. <laughs> You're going to go her with it. Well, okay. Maybe well, we all can... ought to go and do a podcast from out there. <laughs> Good there luck go. getting so I'm reception. just all huffing and puffing and walking around. <laughs> Sweating and stepping on cactus and <laughs> yeah. nothing but tarantulas and diamondbacks. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, you can have fun. I'll stay here. <laughs> Yeah, you're yeah. more of a, you know, you can take care of the corns here. Yes, I will. You're more of a housekeeper like, of snakes, not Excuse house. Me. You know, you know what Excuse I mean. Me. You know what I mean. Yeah, quit while you're ahead. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you guys for watching, anyone who's watching. And um, if, you wanna, pythons .com. if you want to catch this podcast later, it will be on SoundCloud, iTunes, anywhere you get podcasts. If you want to buy our shirts. Check us out on portcitypythons.com, our Instagram, Port City Pythons, Facebook, Port City Pythons, obviously YouTube, Port City Pythons. Also, one more plug for Southeast Carpet Fest. That is February 10th in Cape Coral, Florida at Dave Palumbo's house. And first plug for Southern Carpet Fest <laughs> in Terrell, 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 Terrell Texas. Terrell. At um, the home of Ryan Sullivan, who runs Ivory Connection, and that is going to be the and weekend one of small Cinco de announcement. That's going to be the weekend of Seco de Mayo. So that's May fifth and sixth, Southern Carpet Fest. We will be at that one. Okay. Okay. Well, and I'm going to have Dave Palumbo, <laughs> who's hosting South Southeast Carpet Fest, on for a little mini sode on mm -hmm. Thursday, I believe. Are you just do it to live? We're going to probably do it live on YouTube at some time. It will be a random ass time. So if you're here, you're here. If you're not, you can catch it on download. We'll be talking a little bit about his facility, his collection, and Southeast Carpet Fest. Thank you guys so much for listening, watching, doing all you do. We will catch you guys later. Thanks for having me.